Hello, this is the third and a and final, by the way, in a set of recordings on multiple comparisons. The first two recordings uh, referred to the multiple comparisons part one notes. This recording refers to the multiple comparisons part two notes. And as I always say, you should have read through the notes before watching the video. And the point of the video isn't to go through every single slide, but to hit various high points. So we've talked about the four multiple comparison methods jump supports. That is, all possible two sample t-tests, basically compare each pair. Done its method to make comparisons to a control. Three shoes MCB, multiple comparison with best method for finding a best in terms of a largest or a smallest treatment. And then finally, the Tukey Kramer honestly significant difference method, which like uh, the student T procedure, makes all possible comparisons, but does so in a manner such that it maintains a low false discovery rate. So remember, the uh, two sample t-test procedure has the highest power to find real differences and also has the highest false discovery rate. Um, Dunnitz has less, a little less power and but holds the false discovery rate low but is only useful if you have a control. Shoes method is actually very nice. The power is similar to the student T procedure, but it holds the false discovery rate uh, low, but is only appropriate if your goal is to find a best response level. And then finally, Tukey Kramer has the lowest power of all of them. It finds the fewest real differences, but it does hold the false discovery rate low over a lot of tests. So what I'm going to do now is just go through these methods, but use an example where there's subsampling. In other words, all the methods I showed you uh, so far, I use the filtration data or the impurities data. There's no subsampling. But what if I'm taking multiple observations per experimental unit? Then, as we showed in the one-factor experimental notes, you need to use fit model and set up your model to deal with um, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> existence of subsampling. So we have the sampling error and the experimental error. This was completely explained in the one factor notes, so I won't go back through all the details. So I'm going to go to jump and I'm going to open up the root growth experiment that we covered uh, quite extensively in the notes, uh, one factor notes. So I'm going to go to analyze fit model. So remember when we have uh, subsampling, we have to tell jump how to compute the experimental error, the differences between the replicate experimental units within each level of the factor, and then jump from there can separate out the subsampling error from the experimental error. So our fixed effect or experimental factor is stimulator. The replicates are the plots to which the uh, root growth stimulant were applied. This was growing turf on golf courses. Then we have to tell jump that plots are nested within the stimulator, so the plots are unique to each stimulator, and that the plots are just a random effect or random sample. And we want to calculate the experimental error from the replicate plots within each stimulator and separate it out from the sampling error or the differences between the plots in each group. And we're going to go ahead and use the default REML method. Okay, so I click Run. So we go through the, we've done this before, so there's our variance component analysis. There's our overall ANOVA, 
and the p-value is very small indicating there are real differences. Okay. But how do we do these multiple comparison techniques? Well, it turns out if you use the FIT model platform, it takes care of the problem. It knows how to calculate the standard errors of differences correctly when there is subsampling and replication. So what I'm going to do, I click on the main report menu, and it actually does two procedures. It does students T or Tukey Kramer. Okay, or you can do individual contrasts, which I've illustrated in the one factor notes. We'll just do students T. Okay, and notice it gives you the connecting letters reports. And what it's saying for this method, okay, that uh, B and C cannot be told apart and D and B cannot be told apart. Um, my goal here isn't to go into depth, but to show you how to do the tests, and then we can do Tukey Kramer. Okay. So the Tukey Kramer method and the student T method in this case come to the same conclusions as to which stimulators may be different. And this is, and these differences in the tests are calculated correctly when there's subsampling and replication. And this is all explained in the part two notes for multiple comparisons, if you want to see the details. OK. I'll go back to the notes. And I'm going to just click down. I'm going to go back and forth to jump. So OK. There's another method, and I thought I would put it in here. But another method, uh, or an alternative to ANOVA, called analysis of means. This was invented, I think, in the 1950s. And it's a graphical approach to ANOVA. And I show it because some people find it more intuitive. And this is done in JUMP. And what it is, <coughs> for each treatment, you calculate some boundaries. And if the sample average exceeds the boundaries, then you say that group is significantly different than the overall average. This method tests for differences overall. Okay. But it can also be used to show you which differences um, might be significant. Well, it turns out this is actually done in JUMP in the FIT Y by X platform. So I'm just going to show you an example. And if you want, you can go back and uh, read through the details. So I'm going to go to jump. Okay. And I think I'll use the impurities data again. So I go to fit y by x. Okay. Filtration is x. And the impurities is the response. Okay. And if we do ANOVA, okay, we get the ANOVA table. And the overall F test is significant. And this is the traditional approach. But you have to invest some time in ANOVA to actually understand the arithmetic and the interpretation. And why some people like analysis of beans, which is making a big comeback thanks to software doing the test for people, is that it's graphical and easy to explain. So. There is analysis of means is an option in the report menu. And I'm going to pick the first one okay, for means. And I'm going to show a summary report. Okay. And what happens, there's a lower decision limit and an upper decision limit. Okay. And the center line is the overall grand average of the response. So if any treatment means plot outside of the decision limits, they are considered significantly different than the grand average. In other words, that appears to be a significant effect. So notice that A plots well outside of the upper decision limit. So it's a significant effect. And if you look down, if we can capture it here, B, C, and D all plot below the lower decision limit. They also appear to be have significant effects, particularly C. 
And that's all there is to it, and it's called analysis of means. Very nice procedure. Uh, people really like to use it, especially with audiences not really familiar with the inner workings of ANOVA because it's visual. You just have these decision limits, and if anything plots out outside the decision limits, that's considered a significant effect. Okay. So again, I'll go back to the notes, and I wanted to cover one more topic. <clears throat> you know, we've talked a lot about the false discovery problem, and we've talked about uh, ways of controlling it. Uh, again, you can use different methods. For instance, Tukey Kramer's HSD procedure controls for it. I mentioned the so-called Bonferroni procedure. And what Bonferroni means is for each test, we pick a very small uh, level of the p-value to reject a null hypothesis. The problem is when we have a lot of tests, these p-values become so small they're just virtually useless. Well, Benjamini and Hochberg came up with a different approach. And in their approach, what they do, they adjust the significance level as the number of tests go up. In other words, they're adjusting the rate, overall rate, at which false discoveries can occur. And this procedure is very popular in uh, pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. I'm not going to give you a complete rundown of the method. Again, you can read the notes, and I'm going to demonstrate it in jump. My goal here is that you be familiar with the existence of what's called Benjamini Hochberg. Okay. First, suppose the null hypothesis is actually true. Okay. And you do a large series of tests, yet there are no differences at all between any of the groups. Well, it turns out when you calculate the p-values in this case, and this is the key point, they have a uniform distribution. In other words, for every test you do, you know, you're looking for differences, the p-values are randomly varying from 0 to 1. Okay? And typically, people use this cutoff of 0 0.05. Again, although it's widely used, it actually uh, has no real basis in any theory. And there's also the problem, as we stated earlier, the more tests you do, the higher the experiment-wise error rate gets, the bigger the false discovery rate. So we'd like to have a procedure that keeps adjusting that false discovery rate to keep it reasonable as we do more tests. And that's what Benjamini and Hochberg did. So to give you an example on slide 19, there's a plot of the p-values for 1,000 uh, hypothesis test and the null hypothesis is true. And as you can see, they varied uniformly from 0 to 1 and about 50 tests fall below 0.05, which is what you would expect, a 5% false discovery rate. Okay. But the null hypothesis we know is true in the simulation. Okay. Well, what happens in practice? And in this case, and I'm going to show you the data in a moment, we've done 235 two-sample t-tests, and we've used a fixed criterion of 0.05. Okay and approximately 48% of the tests ended up below the cutoff of 0.05. Okay? In other words, it's a false, there's going to be a lot of false discoveries. So if you look in the plot at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that as you look at the uh, p-values sorted in ascending order, 48% of them fell between 0.05, fell below 0.05, but you know what? A lot of these are probably false discoveries because, in point of fact, we did 235 tests. So the probability is very high that we're going to have false discoveries. So the idea of Benjamin, 
uh, Benjamini Hochberg was to abandon using a fixed criterion, as I said, and then adjust uh, the criterion as you do more comparisons. And I'm going to just illustrate it uh, for you, okay, in jump. Let's see where I want to show it. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead over to jump and show you Benjamini Hochberg and how it actually works. Let's see. Okay. So this is a, an analysis of a number of facilities and instruments, and we want to make comparisons between the instruments within each facility. So I'm going to go to Analyze. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, where did I put it? Okay, Response Screening. It's in the Modeling submenu. Okay. So X is Instrument. I want to compare instruments. And there are 235 comparisons I want to make. And the response is the measured response of the instrument doing a standard analysis. Okay. So let me close this, go back to jump. And this is the key report. Okay. This is what's called a false discovery rate adjusted report. Okay. And the p values. So the red line are the traditional p-values. And again, as I showed earlier, about 48% of them fall below okay, the 0.05 criterion. Okay. But in the Benjamini Hochberg case, we're constantly adjusting the p-values. So that 0.05, okay, I'm still using that criterion. But in point of fact, less tests are falling below it. Okay? So basically, what's going on with Benjamini Hochberg, I'm seeing, I'm actually, and it's hard to see here, I just realized, this red line is the Benjamini Hochberg line. So using Benjamini Hochberg, it turns out that only 5% of those p-values actually fall below the Benjamini Hochberg line. The other way people do Benjamini Hochberg is just to actually increase mathematically the size of the p-values, and then that's the blue line. These are adjusted p-values, and only 5% fall below. So the adjusted uh, p-values are easier to read, but visually, that red sloping line or ramp uh, forms the basis for rejection. And notice, for the, the actual p-values, much less of them actually fall below the line. And then we can calculate the effects. By the way, this is done on something called log worth. It's the negative of the log of the p-value. Jump likes it. But you can see, if you look through this, it gives you a good idea okay, of where there appear to be real differences. Okay. So this is actually just the idea of Benjamini Hochberg. The key is you either adjust the p-values up, or the rejection criterion is reduced, and it keeps the false discovery rate down. Very popular technique these days in pharma and biotech where they have to do a lot of comparisons. And that actually concludes this video, and this is the last one on multiple comparisons.